Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for Invisible Men, How to Work with Prison Rape, Rape Survivors. My name is Bo Smith, Program Associate at JDI and I will be moderating today's webinar. JDI is a health and human rights organization that works to end sexual violence in all forms of detention. JDI has three core goals, to hold government officials and agencies accountable for sexual abuse in their facilities, to change public attitudes about sexual violence behind bars, and to ensure survivors of prisoner rape get the help they need. It is our fundamental belief that when the government takes away someone's freedom, it takes on an absolute responsibility to protect that, prisoner, that person's safety. No matter what crime someone has committed, rape is not part of the penalty. We know that sexual abuse is not an inevitable part of prison life. Prisons and jails with committed leaders, good policies, and sound practices can keep inmates safe. We would like to take a moment and thank the Office of Violence Against Women for its generous support of this webinar and our larger project called No Bad Victims, Support of Incarcerated Survivors. Just a few things before we get started. You can submit questions and comments throughout the webinar using the question box on the right side of your screen. A closed caption recording of this webinar will be posted on our website in the next few days. We'll send you more information later today, including a link on an evaluation for your feedback. We've attached a few handouts, which can be found on the right side of your screen. You'll find the slides for today's webinar, the publication, Hope Behind Bars, an Advocate's Guide to Helping Survivors of Sexual Abuse and Detention, and a tip sheet on corresponding with incarcerated survivors by, by letter. We have a wide range of other resources available on our website. We'll review those in more detail at the end of today's webinar. Men and boys who have been sexually victimized have a right to a full range of services that fully support their needs. We know that many rape crisis centers and advocates have made efforts to ensure that volunteers and staff are trained on the needs and experiences of male survivors and that the full range of services are available to male survivors at your rape crisis center. In addressing sexual abuse against male survivors, it is important to consider sexual violence in institutional settings. Since the vast majority of prisoner rape survivors are men, this website aims to give advocates the tools to start working with this population. During today's webinar, we'll look at some terms and definitions that will be helpful as you begin to continue to do this work. We'll talk about the prevalence and dynamics of sexual abuse in male detention facilities. We'll hear from Jeff England, uh, Inglet, a survivor of sexual abuse in a youth detention facility, who will talk about his experience and his journey to heal. We'll review the short and long-term impact of this abuse on men and boys, and we'll provide tools to help advocates serve this population. We'll also hear from Jessica Seipel, um, an advocate who has worked with incarcerated survivors in men's prisons, youth detention facilities. Jessica will talk about the in-person counseling she provided to two clients. By the end of the webinar, we hope you will have a better understanding of dynamics of sexual abuse in male detention facilities, develop an understanding to how, of how to work more effectively with male survivors in detention, and learn best practices for promoting healing, ensuring safety for this population. We'll end with time to answer some of your questions. Like, I, I'm sorry, I'd now like to hand things over to our two presenters, Tara Peterson Shabazz and Eric Stiles, to introduce themselves and get things started. Hi, my name is Eric Stiles and I'm an outreach specialist at the National Sexual Violence Resource Center. I'd like to thank everybody for joining this webinar today and let everybody know that you can do this work. And I'll pass off to Tara now. Good morning, everyone. As Bo mentioned, my name is Tara Peterson Shabazz. I'm a program, program director at JDI. I provide training and technical assistance to correction officials and advocates across the country. And just to provide you with a little background about myself, I have more than 15 years of experience addressing domestic violence, youth violence, sexual assault, and reproductive rights. I spent a decade working at the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence, including five years as its executive director. Throughout my career, I've paid special attention to preventing violence against women and working with local advocacy 
organizations on building their capacity to increase services to underserved communities. So it's a pleasure to be here and I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you, Tara. And um, when we start off, we'd like to start off with a survivor acknowledgement. We understand this space, there are survivors of sexual violence and those who've been affected by sexual violence on a very personal level. And we also want to acknowledge that we are not speaking for all survivors of sexual violence. We're speaking from our experiences and what we've learned through the years of work. And next, we'd like to talk about self-care. The content of this webinar can be triggering for some of you in attendance. We encourage you to take care of yourselves and find an individual you can talk to, reach out to, to find support. Also, this is a learning experience, and it may bring up for you the idea that you have done wrong in the past. This webinar is definitely not to shame you, but rather to assist you in taking those gifts um, from the knowledge and lived experiences here and moving that forward in time to help all survivors um, that you serve in the future. We'd like to start off with an audience question, and this is where you can use the chat box to please um, just type in. Um, first off is, what are you hoping to learn from today's webinar? And if you feel comfortable, just use the chat box. We'll take a few moments um, to give you a, some time to respond. And as you all type in the chat box, I know that others will be paying attention to um, some of the um, ideas that you're hoping to learn, and we're hoping to touch upon all of these concepts as we move forward throughout this webinar. And I see you're adding them to the question box. Um, Um, better ways for working with survivors, um, anything to provide, um, anything for better services. I'm helping to learn um, the unique challenges of male survivors in sexual assault and sexual violence, the obstacles, um, helping to learn how to create um, safe space for incarcerated individuals, um, how to deal with inmates that report um, when they are raped, um, how to better serve be it for male advocates, uh, male survivors, more tools, a more pers um, perspective and working with male survivors, general needs of the uh, population. And as these questions keep coming in, these desires, I see there's a theme and how to, um, you're looking for more information, general information, and some really concrete tools on working with survivors. And to gain a better understanding of what, the, what happens to male survivors while they're incarcerated. I believe this webinar is going to be of support to you and help to you. So I hope that as we move forward, you get some of these questions answered. But please feel free to reach out to um, the presenters and panelists today for more support. So we're going to move on into the very first part, and that's understand the language that we use. Um, the language that we construct is very, very important, and so often, um, the language gets confused across disciplines, across um, individual experiences, and these terms were just some of the terms that we grabbed, I grabbed and put together, and to illustrate how different they are depending on where you are in the system of incarceration, what position of power you hold, and what your label is. So when you start looking at corrections officer and parole officer and prisoner, how do those terms relate to each other? They relate to each other very intimately. And sometimes the corrections officers are the ones who are offending against the male inmates. So that term of corrections officer or parole officer, these terms of power that have over inmates and prisoners. Now as we move forward through sexual harassment and sexual violence, those are terms in our field that we use that maybe not necessarily an individual who's incarcerated um, might relate to or have understanding, just like survivor and victim. Um, often I, 
of note, we talk about perpetrator a lot in the advocacy field, sexual violence advocacy field, and this term is used differently for those who are in, um, inmates. Um, just like um, we have a term used for those who sexually offend, perpetrator is often used as a perpetrator of a crime, which creates them to be an inmate. So that term is used differently between parole officers and corrections officers in those systems. So as we move forward, think about these terms in a way that we're going to be defining them throughout this webinar, and they get really mixed together. So the basics of sexual abuse and male detention centers, I'm going to hand over to Bo and Tara. Great. Thanks, Eric. Um, this is Tara. So now let's go over some statistics to give you a glimpse of just how big a problem we're talking about. We know that over 2.3 million adults and about 70,000 youth are incarcerated in U.S. prisons, jails, and youth detention facilities across the country. We also know that a vast majority, over 90% of all prisoners in the U.S. are male. In 2012, African American men were six times and Latino men 2.5 times more likely to be in prison than white men. If current trends of incarceration continue, one in three African American men born today can expect to spend time in prison during his lifetime. Likewise, the majority of incarcerated youth are males, making up 86% of young people in detention in the United States. In regards to sexual abuse of men, in a recent study, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, one in 11 former inmates in men's state prison reported that they have suffered some form of sexual abuse during their most recent period of incarceration. This could have been at any time during their incarceration, at a lockup, a jail, a state prison, or a community confinement facility. It's also important to keep in mind that this is only during one period of incarceration. When we're talking about youth, the numbers are even higher. In another study of youth, of youth in detention, one in 10 males in juvenile detention facilities reported being sexually abused while in detention. In terms of who's perpetrating the abuse in adult facilities against male survivors, studies have shown us that those male inmates surveyed who said they were abused approximately half reported sexual abuse by staff and the other half by inmates. So in other words, inmates are about as likely to be sexually abused by staff as they are by other inmates. And the majority of staff abusers in men facilities are women. And they can be everything from a line officer to a contractor working in a, in a kitchen. In youth facilities, the abusers are much more likely to be staff members than other youth. A BJS study from 2013 found that those residents who reported having been sexually abused while incarcerated, 82% said the perpetrator was a staff member. Of those staff abusers, over 90% were women. In other words, for the majority of sexual abuse in youth detention facilities, the perpetrators were female staff members. I also want to mention that in all the previous slides we just reviewed, it's important to note the sobering nature of the information given and realize it's not a full picture. It's a snapshot and we believe that there are many more survivors who do not report for various reasons. We know that anyone can be sexually abused in detention and in the community, but there are certain people who are more vulnerable. This is true in both male and female institutions, but especially true in male facilities. Men who are gay or bisexual and transgender men and women are at heightened risk for sexual abuse and sexual harassment in custody. And even those who are perceived to be LGBT are more vulnerable. Research shows us that people with severe mental illness are nine times more likely to be sexually abused. People who have a history of sexual abuse are often targeted while in custody. First timers are people who aren't necessarily street smart. Young people are those who are small or may appear to be weak. And minorities, meaning people who are a minority within the specific institution. And finally, those with physical disabilities. We're now going to um, hand it over to Eric, who's going to discuss some of the things for us to consider when working with men. And, and thank you, Tara. And talking about our movement as advocates, the sexual assault advocates, we often use Lydia Guy's um, sexual violence spectrum. And we're all very familiar with the way this 
diagram um, really tries to explain the intricacies of sexual violence. However, this is this common spectrum that we discuss um, does not represent the lived experience of many males who have experienced sexual violence. Um, when an individual comes forward to talk to another about their victimization, they use the language they feel most comfortable using. And for men in our culture, there has not been the language of rape or sexual harassment as being seen applies to them. This leads to inability to use the normal, uh, these normal quote unquote words that we use in our movement. Um, it is important for us to use language of the survivor and meet them where they are at. I know we've said this over and over again in the movement, but it's very, very important. This is done to um, avoid the redefining of their experience, minimizing it or labeling it with our terms that they do not have the same meaning for them. And for us to be able to communicate accurately with survivors, we need to hear them on their own terms and keep this in the back of our mind. Kara? Sorry, I'm sorry about that. And one thing I would just like to add that is, um, just as in the community, sexual abuse is an act of violence and it is used to establish and maintain power and control. Um, the spectrum of sexual violence can include a few dynamics that are somewhat unique to a detention s a setting, especially men's prisons and jails. One that I like to mention is protective pairing. It's an arrangement where one prisoner demands sex from another prisoner in exchange for providing protection. It's often referred to as, quote, and unquote, hooking up or getting married. And these pairings are sexually abusive, even though it may appear to, appear to be consensual. Thank you. And in light of what Tara has just shared um, through all the statistics, we're wondering um, this question to ask the audience, and you can write again in the question um, box, um, what factors do you think influence someone's in sharing that they have been victimized? And we'll give a moment for the responses there. Not wanting to have it happen, very big reason, retaliation, ensuring safety, and that's a really key thing that safety is not um, able to be expressed or have in the environment. Um, retaliation again, depression, fear, fear of not being believed, a previous history of sexual abuse, flashbacks. So you're giving a lot of the, the big reasons why, and as you keep typing in and everybody can see, the term um, safe for these individuals is often seen as confusing for advocates. So this is due to our confidence in what we provide safe space to share our stories in sexual violence centers is wholly different than that can be produced in a jail or prison system. Um, this is due to lack of knowledge of being shared with the individual and respect to confidentiality or misinformation given to individuals. Um, in my local work in a county jail, I know it was really important for me to express um, that I was not part of jail, that to express um, that I would not go back and I would not tell the guards or advocates and really express what confidentiality was. Um, so as people keep writing in, there seems to be more responses around the safety, uh, whether or not there's emotional safety for disclosure, very important. And so keeping in mind uh, what factors influence someone's sharing is really key. And there's a lot of good reasons here why a person won't come forward, a male won't come forward. And I'll pass this off to Bo to talk more in depth from a story. I'd like to now introduce Jeff Inglet. Jeff was locked up starting when he was just 13 years old. While he was at a residential treatment home, he was sexually abused by a staff member. Later, he was incarcerated in the California Department of Corrections for three decades and was released in March of 2015. Jeff speaks publicly on rehabilitation after incarceration and also as an Alcohol Anonymous speaker. Thank you, Jeff, for joining us today and being willing to share your story. You're welcome. It all started when I was 13 years old and I was placed in a juvenile residential treatment home. My parents had sent me there because I was smoking marijuana and they were worried about me. I was the youngest kid in there at that time. Soon after I arrived, one of the doctors called me in for a physical exam. During this exam, the doctor grabbed my testicles, put a glove on, and then told me he was going to give me a prostate examination. I had had normal physicals before and knew this wasn't normal. That was the first time I was abused. Three or four days later, 
He called me back and he did the same procedure again. It struck me as, as odd, but I was, I, but I really didn't know. I was only 13 years old. The third time, two or three days later, I came back in and he tried to do it again, but this time I refused to get up on the table naked. I already had dropped my pants and then he wanted me to climb up on the table just like the past two times. This time I told him I am not doing that. He said, you're going to do it, but I refused and I pulled my pants up and started to button them. Then he said, you're going to do it or I'm going to push an alarm. And I said, you're going to do what you're going to do and I'm not doing that. And so he pushed the alarm. When the alarm goes off, there are no questions about what's taking place. The staff just responded in mass. I was beaten to the floor, dragged out of the doctor's office, hit into the hall, into the walls and the doorways. They took me into the rubber room, which is a segregated padded cell, and they slammed me on a bed. I was fighting the whole way, trying to get away. They restrained my hands and feet, and the whole time I was still screaming. Then the nurse came in and started cutting away my clothes, and then a different doctor came in with a syringe full of Thorazine. And as I felt the sharp pain in my buttocks, it was shortly thereafter, I mean real quick thereafter, that I didn't remember anything until about three days later. Next thing I knew, I was walking down a corridor in the wing that I was in, dressed in a hospital gown with the back open. I didn't know it had been three days until I ran into the people in my wing who told me so. That became an ongoing experience with me. I felt I couldn't trust any authority figure. Anytime the staff and I had a disagreement, and we had a lot of disagreements, I would respond in a violent manner. I already knew where the situation was going. It was going to turn into me being beaten down and dragged into the rubber room. That became my time out for those four and a half months that I was in that institution. I knew I knew what the worst punishment could be, so in my mind, I wanted them to feel the pain that I knew I was going to feel over the next few days in that room. At the time, I didn't understand why I was put in that institution. I knew I wasn't a bad kid, and I still felt that way when I left the institution. Once I got out, I was really angry, and I started using drugs and alcohol to feel better and to numb the pain of what I went through. Then my mind started to play tricks on me, and I thought, Maybe I really am a bad person, and that's why I needed to be in there. So I kept doing drugs and alcohol. I kept running away from home, and I became more violent. For a long time, I wasn't sure if the abuse had actually happened. I tried telling my family after it happened. My mom didn't think it was that bad, and it didn't, and didn't want to talk about it. My dad didn't believe me because the staff at the institution had already told him that I would make up anything to try to get out of there. It wasn't until several years later when I, was, when I crossed paths with a former employee of the institution. We recognized each other, and I immediately started chasing him. That's when he said to me, it wasn't my fault. I was only doing what I was told. He was one of the staff who physically abused me. I knew what had happened to me and what he had done. At that moment, I knew that what I had lived through was real, and I knew it wasn't my fault. Knowing that... It only made me more angry and sent me further down a path of violence and destruction. I eventually ended up spending 33 years in prison. I didn't have anyone to talk to about it, not a counselor or a therapist or anyone else. I thought no one would believe me, so I didn't ask for help. It seemed futile. It wasn't until more than 25 years later that I finally saw a psychologist while I was in prison. During my second session with her, we started talking about what happened to me when I was 13, and I just started crying uncontrollably. Whenever I would see her, I would leave feeling happy and relieved, but soon after I would become despondent. I learned through my therapy that even though I had worked on my problems over the years, I had only been working on them on the surface. Now that I was going deeper, it was causing me a lot of pain and turmoil. I ended up seeing her for almost three years. If I had been able to meet with that psychologist or any counselor or advocate right after the abuse happened, I don't think I, I think it would have changed my life. I would have had someone who would have believed what I was saying and believed in me. I could have trusted them and they could have helped me through what I had just been through.
If I had had an advocate or a counselor, I wish they would have told me, listen, I'm here for you. I'm not here for the state. I'm not here for the investigation. I'm not here for any of this. I'm here for you. I am an advocate on your behalf, and what I need you to know is that what we discuss is confidential unless you want me to get you help, unless you want me to try and take care of things. You have to make that clear to them that you do not have the intention of violating their confidence. That's important because that opens up a bridge to conversation. Remember that in prison, people lose their identities. You become a number, a nobody, and nobody cares about you as a person. Each human being is uniquely different. Listen and pay attention to each person's story and situation. By doing that, you can help them work through what they need. If you're telling them how to fix things, you're not actually giving them the support they need from you. When the time comes, they'll tell you what they need from you. There are clear signals. The last thing I want to say is that in prison, things are all set to move on a clock, fast, quick, and in a hurry. It's really important to talk to each person at their own pace. By doing that, you're acknowledging that human being for who they are. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for sharing your story. Um, it's very courageous of you, and hearing your story again brings to mind that you highlight every major key point an advocate needs to hold on to with your story, and that is um, sharing that you're confidential, you're not there for other individuals, you're there to be their advocate. You believe the individual, you believe what they're going through, and you let them tell their own story in their own time, in their own pace, and realize that identities get stripped in prison and that you're there as an advocate to hear an individual tell their story. And everything you've said, if advocates can hold on to in prison settings, let alone other settings, that makes them even better advocates. Thank you again. As we move forward and talk about this, the next couple of slides that we're going to go through, we're going to do some reframing of some of the emotional reactions of survivors, and no two male survivors are going to be the same or express their emotions the same or express their experience the same. This is merely a guide for you things outside the normal context of a lot of what our field um, teaches us that survivors respond like, um, that there's an emotional response that we're normally trained to hear. So this will help you shift to a different layer and help hold on to new identities uh, with each of the experiences. So. As we move on, the very first thing for your organization, I want you to take back this question. The slide is, what can our advocates do to assist incarcerated survivors and create safety? Um, take this question back. I often look at safety. Um, if you think of it as building a house, you need tools and resources. And while you're incarcerated, you lack many of the resources that we have on the outside. Friends, family, access to phones, religious groups, for example. Uh, when we lack these many common tools, they're stripped away from us. We cannot go for a walk, clear our mind, take a car ride, center ourselves. So your sense of safety, safety is altered. Those are just the very basics, not to mention the real life threats against your being. Um, your control is taken from you. You're told when to sleep and eat and during all the day. So there's really these large threats to your safety and the ability to create a home to talk and discuss who your, uh, what's going on in your life. So you as an advocate going into a prison setting or incarcerated setting really needs to create that safety with the survivor. And that means, like Jeff said, bring up the idea of confidentiality, who you're gonna, not going to tell, that you're there for them and only them. And as we move forward um, into the next slide, um, these are things that we often think about. Anger is often seen in their movement as a negative. Um, this is seen very distinct, um, distinctly when the anger is expressed in loud, aggressive ways. Anger is not social constant. Many cultures shift the way in which we express anger. In some cultures, you are taught to direct it inward and others outward. Uh, for some males, you have experienced sexual violence and have no control over their safety. Anger may be the only emotion in which they feel safe to hide behind. It's not something to fear. It's not something to work with on the survivor to fix. It's to work with the survivor, find ways of using it for transformation into action. So you meet them where they are emotionally. You know that anger may be the first emotion, but there's a whole deep sets of layers of emotions underneath and it may resurface. And I understand that 
many individuals are labeled as troublemakers or getting into fights. And as Jeff said, his anger only increased throughout the years, the longer that he had no one there to hear him. And it might be the first emotion to, to kind of burst out because usually anger, if you think about it, leads itself into the world very forcefully. So it's a way of expressing yourself. Um, you look into the idea of fear. Um, if you think about how fear um, creates an environment for incarcerated individuals, it can be expressed in many different ways. Um, but one thing to think about is silence, and that silence is something we can take note of, and it's actually a person expressing themselves. And that silence may be because they're afraid of telling you because they're afraid you're going to tell somebody else. They're afraid that you're part of the system. Um, there is no one way to express fear. It might come out very fast. A person might explain they're fearful and tell you exactly everything they're fearful of, or come out very slow or not at all. And working with survivors around fear, we center ourselves on being able to work through this and find support from our supervisors. It's very key to go back to our agency and find support. Um, fear is not something that there is no reason for. It's not something people are making up. It's expressed differently for different people. And it's often fear of the future, and we don't just brush it off. So that's why we need a lot of help with supervision back at our agency. So take that back to your agency. Of how can we supervise the emotions, the very strong emotions that are thrown at us in this very brief time period? And as we move forward, speaking of organizations, um, this is a question for your organization. How can we decrease the sense of isolation and despair for our incarcerated individual survivors? And I use incarcerated survivors over and over again, but to me they're people. How do we help with isolation for these men? Uh, we, we develop key policies. Um, we, and these kind of policies are around the idea of what does it mean for you to provide access to supports in an incarcerated. Now with PREA, that's going to help out a lot, having MOUs um, to work with incarcerated settings. But it also means collecting other resources in the community um, and offering choice. Um, very key, just saying, what would you like to share today? Um, or what would you like to talk about? Really decreases the isolation and despair because you're meeting them where they're at and it's not your agenda going in. The next thing that we want to talk about is drug use. Um, there are many different ways that we try and regulate ourselves with addictions um, after sexual violence has taken place. We've been taught this over and over again. That's why you like this image. We have food addictions. We have sexual compulsion. We use drugs or alcohol. And it's a way of coping with the pain. And the neurobiology of trauma illustrates how we use all of these coping skills to either numb ourselves, make ourselves feel better, and we need to understand and help an individual with these coping skills. We don't need to tell them to take them away from them. Um, what's your agency's policy on working with somebody who's actively using when you're talking to them? You need to know that as an advocate so that when you're faced with that, you can deal with that without feeling disconnected from the person sitting across from you that you're talking with. Um, and as we move forward, I want to bring up the conversation around suicidal thoughts. Um, your organization needs to figure out how do we support individuals who have suicidal thoughts that are incarcerated and what are the resources in their community. And it's important for us to find a full range of resources and supports for those who are incarcerated. Um, for example, often I go into agencies and the response about suicidal thoughts is here's a suicidal ho suicide hotline number, the phone number. And if you're incarcerated, you can't always get a phone. You can't get access to that phone. So what are some creative ways that your agency can work with policies with the prison or a jail setting? Like, can you figure out a, a phone they can use or a safe space where they can call the suicide, the suicide hotline? Are there other resources um, that might be helpful for working with individuals who have suicidal thoughts, meaning other agencies coming in to talk about suicide and what they can do to moderate that? Are there screenings that the agency can help provide or support? So really dig into this question you get back to your agency. It sounds very small, but it's a very large question. Um, and someone mentioned earlier the idea of complex trauma histories and reasons why individuals don't come forward. And that's very, very true. We know this, a history of trauma. Um, 
we talk about this often in our movement, that if you have previous childhood sexual abuse, um, that really affects and shapes the way you deal with um, subsequent traumas or sexual violence, and no two people are alike. If you're being sexually harassed currently on top of the sexual violence while incarcerated, that affects your ability to come forward because the current status of your world is actually threatening. Um, the lack of control, um, it's similar to what I've already said, the idea that if you are told when to eat, when to sleep, when to do all these things, you kind of get lost in your identity and yourself and you just go in this kind of robot mode of I wake up, I eat breakfast, I do X, Y, and Z, and there's really no room to deal with problems because you're trying to get through to the next part of the day to get the day over with, to go to sleep, to wake up and start over again, to get one more day out of the way. There's retaliation that can happen and that often, and they're going to hear about other individuals on this panel speak of it, but retaliation from staff members, uh, retaliation being moved, um, lengthening sentences, isolation, punishment, um, fears of other sexual abuse and repeated abuse on you, that someone's going to attack you after you disclose. So these are just some of the ways to help start shifting your way and your view on what um, you lived experiences are like for a male survivor. So I'm going to pass this off now to Tara, and she's Great. going to take the next part. Great. Thank you, Eric. So Eric, you just talked about some of the complexity of dealing with trauma, particularly about repeated abuse, lack of control, and retaliation. And I just want to reiterate that those are real fear for people that are incarcerated. I'm going to share a, story, a survivor story with you that illustrates some of the dynamics that Eric just spoke about and also some of the challenges that incarcerated survivors face in reporting abuse, um, particularly abuse by a staff member. It impacts their ability to heal and to come forward and report the abuse. Here's Ivory's written testimony that he sent us in a letter while he was incarcerated. Ivory has since been released and is on parole. I was assigned to work as an administrative porter for the major and captain, which included taking care of the incoming officers. I prepared their lunches, drinks, or whatever I was told to do by these officers. This particular officer began to show interest in me as though she really appreciated what I did for them. She would sometimes sit and talk to me about family things, such as her children, husband, and other things. Then she began to talk about her childhood. She would tell me things that were so sad things like how people would take advantage of her. Knowing all this, I felt a sense of pity for her. I would do special little things like have the coffee, food, drinks ready for her as soon as she got her breaks. So one day, we were in the captain's lobby. I was washing some cups, and she was standing there talking as usual. And then all of a sudden, she said, how long have you been locked up? Before I could answer, she closed the closet door and began holding me and kissing me. I, ple I pleaded with her that I couldn't do this. She got angry and kept telling me to be quiet. When she stopped, she became somewhat apologetic. I became real nervous and scared. When she left, I worried about what just happened. I had this boss that I felt close to, so when I got my nerves together, I went to talk to this officer. I told her what happened and who it was. The officer said to me, you know she's crazy, she's been here 10 years and she's been doing things like that. Just stay away from her because she's got children and I hate to see her get fired. So I tried that. It didn't work. The next time was a nightmare. She said, you're trying to get me fired. So I assumed the other officer told, had, told, um, had told her that I said something about the incident. This is when she told me to get down on my knees. If I didn't, she, was, she would say I touched her in an inappropriate way. I knew if she did this, I would definitely receive a new charge. So I got on my knees. She pulled down her pants and pulled her panties over and said, come on, you know how to do this, acting real angry. I was scared as hell because if I had gotten caught, I know she'd say I was raping her. When she left, I quickly told Sergeant G. She, she said it was nothing we could do about it because I was an inmate and she was an officer. I couldn't win that fight. Sergeant G said she watched her, but this sergeant didn't do anything to stop her from assaulting me. I went and I tried to turn this officer in, but the administration fixed it up like I was having consensual sexual relationship with the officer. As far as I know, she was charged with having an improper sexual activity with a person in custody, 
but it wasn't consensual relationship. They fixed it the way they wanted to, transferred me, and this was the only major disciplinary ticket I had in 25 years, and this disciplinary is a lie. I served the officer with a statement telling her if she didn't stop sexually abusing me, I would file a formal complaint. But I did fear something like this would happen. Because I worked around the administration, I watched them turn things around on inmates all the time. The, ma the major took information from me to keep me from proving I did seek help to stop the officer from her sexual abuse. The agency allowed her to cop to improper sexual activity with the person in custody and not for the actual crime she committed, sexual assault on a person in custody. They won't tell me the outcome of this ordeal. I request information and receive no answer. My grievance refers me to write Officer of Inspector General for the outcome of this incident. They say that because I'm male, it's impossible for this to happen. And that's not true. I know for a fact. In Texas prisons, an officer can get you killed. So in short, when thinking about Ivory's story, something wrong has happened to him. He was sexually abused, and it's not being acknowledged. In one incident, you have one officer, a sergeant, actually saying to him that because he's an inmate and it was an officer, he's not going to be believed, and that he can't win that fight. On the other hand, you have another person telling him that because he's a male, that it's even impossible for it to happen in the first place. So like many victims, male victims, they don't get a chance to name the victimhood and because there is such a huge culture of masculinity within, in, while being incarcerated. So if you just heard in Ivory's story, staff perpetrators could be prisoners, work supervisor, they can even be mental health staff members as you heard Jeff talk about earlier, or even an outside contractor like a maintenance person or kitchen staff. And what we know from the research is that staff abusers are often female. I want to emphasize here that regardless of a staff member's gender, prisoners can never agree to sexual activity with staff because the staff member will always have power and authority over the prisoner. As you know, willing sexual activity between inmates is against prison policy. However, consensual sex does occur among prisoners. Nevertheless, it's important to not make assumptions. Behaviors that often appear to be voluntary on the surface may actually be the result of coercion and manipulation, fear or need for protection or financial support. We also hear about sexual activity within the context of abusive relationships, much like intimate partner violence in the community. Another type of dynamic could be one where one prisoner has some power over another prisoner, like a shot caller or a person at the top of a particular prison hierarchy. So I hope this gives you a sense of some of the relationship and dynamics of sexual abuse that often exist in men's detention facilities. You can find much more about common dynamics of sexual abuse in custody in JDI's publication called Hope Behind Bars, an Advocate's Guide to Helping Survivors of Sexual Abuse in Detention, which we have attached as a handout. You can find our handouts in the control panel on the right side of your screen. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. I want to remind you all to submit questions for any of your speakers using the question box. Um, now I'd like to introduce Jessica Seipel, who will be talking about some of her direct experiences working with men and boys in detention. Jessica has worked in rape crisis, domestic violence, and sexual health agencies throughout California for seven years. She is a California State Certified Sexual Assault Counselor and Trainer. As an advocate for survivors of sexual and relationship violence, Jessica has offered trauma-informed support and strengths-based counseling from a social justice foundation. Jessica's commitment to anti-oppression work includes providing crisis intervention to survivors behind bars in both adult and youth facilities with the firm understanding that survivors are never to blame for the violent choices of others. She currently works for a prevention education coordinator. She currently works as the prevention education coordinator and trauma counselor for rape Trauma Services in Northern California. Thank you for joining us today, Jessica. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm here just to talk about a couple of my own stories working with incarcerated survivors, specifically providing in-person services. And so um, the first, I guess, story that I will say is about a man named Trace. And um, 
he was in an adult facility. This was my first time supporting an incarcerated survivor in person. So I had had some you know, written correspondence with survivors, but I had never met in person. And um, I just want to talk about that, you know, this was my first time going to a prison. And just to be honest with you all, I was terrified. Um, I kept playing that awful scene from Silence of the Lambs you know, over and over in my head, the one where Jodie Foster walks down the row of cells on her way to interview Hannibal Lecter. And and I was like, oh my God, that's what it's going to be like. I was so scared. And, and there were so many unknowns, a lot of things I was feeling that, frankly, I was kind of ashamed of. And so some of the concerns that I had, you know, what if this person has a violent past? Um, you know, what if they're threatening to me? Um, what if I'm threatened by other inmates that are there? Um, what was really str a struggle for me is what if this person is in prison for sexual assault? Does that create some kind of conflict for, for me? Um, or, you know, really what if this person's just mean to me or what if this is all some kind of joke? And um, I had to really kind of come to terms with my own judgments, um, not only just with working with incarcerated survivors, but working with male incarcerated survivors. And, you know, would I have wondered would I, would I have had the same concerns if Trace were a woman? And um, I kind of had to reconcile that these feelings were normal and that I had to process them ahead of time so that they wouldn't interfere with my support of the survivor. And so uh, Trace was sexually assaulted by a cellmate. And um, he came across our agency, the agency I was working at at the time in Southern California. Um, when he went to the hospital for a forensic exam. And he was referred to me for in-person support. And um, the only information that I had was his name, his date of birth, the date of the exam, and the name of the officer who brought him. And at the time, no one at my agency had been to this facility before. So we sort of had no idea what to do. And um, for several weeks, I made a bunch of phone calls, sent a bunch of emails with no luck, trying to figure out how to get down there. And so I decided one day to just drive down and talk to someone in person, um, I brought a letter for, for Trace just to let him know that I had been trying to figure out how to get there um, so that he knew that we hadn't just kind of forgotten about him. Um, I was able to figure out who the person was to set up a professional visit. Um, the letter was given to this person who gave it to, to Trace. Um, and then what was great is that I was able to get that information about how to schedule future visits and bring it back to my agency so that next time we wouldn't have this delay. Um, and so finally, I was able to meet with Trace. Um, it was about a month or so after the initial hospital exam. Um, and I visited with him a few times. Um, I made it a point to be extremely friendly with the correction staff, and I made no attempts to cover up my lack of knowledge about the system. I wasn't going to try to pretend that I knew, you know, what these words meant and all that stuff. And um, one thing I do want to share with everyone, in my experience, it was absolutely nothing like Silence of the Lambs at all. Um, the facility that I went to had a professional visiting room, and we were able to talk confidentially. Trace and I, and there was a corrections officer that would stand outside, but but, but not inside. And um, talking to Trace, you know, I sort of had no idea what access to resources he had, and he had said that he wanted to write, and um, he had some concerns though about writing a journal, and what if other inmates found his journal where he was writing about his experience as a survivor. And so what we kind of ended up doing was, you know, I, I gave him a journal. He would write his entries, rip them out, and mail them to me, almost like for safekeeping. And um, and it showed a remarkable level of trust, something that I was really grateful for. And um, Trace had family that was all across the state, no one that really had visited him in, in, in several years. And so he was very appreciative just to have someone to talk to that wasn't affiliated with the prison, just someone who had nothing to do with what was happening in that facility. Um, at one point, though, he did ask me if I had worked with other men. And I kind of had to be honest with him because I, I, I hadn't, um, especially adult men. I had worked with boys, but not necessarily adult men. I had to be honest with him about that. And, and I, we talked about statistics of male survivors and how few come forward. And it was kind of an opportunity for me to tell him how courageous he had been in, in, in telling his story and that you know, not many people can do that. Um, so some tips for, for folks that are advocates that are going, that are first timers, I guess. 
um, that it's okay to be nervous, it's okay to be afraid, and that those feelings are normal, um, especially if you've never been to a prison before. And those are normal feelings to have. And what's really important is that you're processing them ahead of time so that you're not bringing that stuff with you, um, so that you're reaching out to colleagues or supervisors or whoever just to kind of talk about, like, hey, I'm really nervous. Maybe there's someone at your agency that's been to a facility like this before, and you can talk to them about it. Um, my own sort of personal rule, and I don't know if different agencies have different policies around this, um, is that I, I never ask an incarcerated survivor what crime they did to get them into that facility. Um, it's not important, I think. Um, it's not necessary for me to know that. Um, and it also helps me to remain non-judgmental and non-blaming and non-shaming if I don't know that information. Um, Trace did share that with me, actually, and I, I didn't ask him to. He just shared it with me. And um, you know that some people might choose to do that, but it's important that that's not us sort of requiring that information unless your agency has some kind of specific policy around that. Um, so that's, that's my adult survivor story. I also have a, a youth survivor story that I'd, I'd like to share with you all. It's a little bit of a different circumstance. Um, I met with Jose. He was a 16-year-old um, gang member. He was on the run due to, due to an arrest warrant. And while he was sleeping on the streets, um, a group of men showed up and attempted to um, gang rape him. A bystander actually alerted the police who arrived, and they saw that there was a warrant out for his arrest. So they brought him into the youth detention facility here in our county. Um, because a bystander had alerted the, the police, they already knew that this attempted assault had happened to him. And, he disclosed to the intake officer who brought him in, although they already knew, so there was kind of like that choice that was taken away from him. Um, we're lucky that this particular youth detention facility has a policy with us that they contact us every time there's any kind of disclosure. So they reached out to us, and um, we coordinated um, in-person crisis counseling. Um, and what was super important when I first met with him is that I wanted to make sure he didn't feel called out. Like I made it a point to say that, you know, we come here anytime someone discloses anything that sounds anything like sexual violence. Um, so I wanted to normalize it for him, but I also wanted to prioritize that his experience was really important. Um, so some of the initial challenges that I experienced with Jose was that he was he was really closed off. He had a very tough exterior. Um, his sort of survival instincts had taught him like to just be really tough and really strong. Um, you know, and I think we all know it's really common for survivors to try to get power back however possible. And so I think that's how he was trying to get his power back was, was just by being really kind of tough and intimidating. And um, he spoke very openly about his life as a gang member and, and, and using violence and, and all this stuff. And I, I sort of interpreted it that he was just trying to feel invulnerable. He was trying to feel really strong. And I, I didn't interpret his behavior as threatening or unsafe for me. I sort of saw it as a natural trauma response. And, and he stated over and over that he didn't want to talk about what had happened. That was the language he had used. He talked about what happened. He didn't want to talk about that. And so we didn't. Um, for the first two or three times I met with him, we didn't talk about it at all. And I, I made it a point to tell him that I wasn't afraid of his story. Um, or of him, but that he got to decide what he wanted to talk about. So we talked about random things, like I asked him what type of movies he likes. We talked about zombie movies, and we both like zombie movies, and he talked to me about his tattoos, and I talked about my tattoos, and we sort of just chatted, I guess you would say, for the first two or three times. And as we sort of built that safety, he started to open up just a little bit more. He talked about um, you know, that his girlfriend was pregnant and that his child was like his hope for the future. And, and that was sort of, I was able to really focus on that sort of motivating factor for, for him. Um, and this kind of goes along with what other folks have been saying throughout the webinar that we, you know, it's super important that we're meeting folks where they're at. And, you know, if, if I had pushed him to talk about what had happened, you know, he, he would have shut down and he would have not wanted to talk with me at all. Um, I think because I made it clear that he got to decide 
when or if he wanted to do that, that he did eventually share with me his own feelings of emasculation uh, and a fear that people would find out and question his sexuality. He said that as a gang member, it was crucial for his safety that he appeared invulnerable. He said that the experience was dehumanizing and that being incarcerated only exacerbated that feeling. Um, kind of like what was mentioned before, that not being able to decide what to wear, when to go outside, what to eat, when to eat, who to talk to, all that stuff made him feel less than human and that for him, choice was an essential part of his humanity. And so I was just trying to give him as many choices as I could. And for me, that was you get to decide what you talk about when you talk about it. Um, part of, I think, the, one of the successes of me being able to meet him where he was at was, um, you know, juvenile facilities are notoriously transient. Youth are constantly coming in and out. Um, the ultimate success for me was, you know, I got a voicemail from him on a Sunday that he had been released unexpectedly and he called my office he asked for my number called my office and left me a voicemail to tell me he was being released and thanking me and that was such a huge deal for for me um, another thing too is just to understand that sometimes intimidating behavior is likely a natural trauma response and we obviously don't want to you know we, we want to be safe but we also want to understand that someone might be really closed off or hard um, just as a survival instinct um, I would also suggest that you show survivors your commitment. So if, if you say that you're going to come on a certain day at a certain time, then you do it. Um, you can't call them and say, hey, I'm sorry, I'm running late or whatever. You, know, you don't have that option, and so it's super important to just stay committed and to you know, don't make promises you can't keep. Um, and then to be patient. You know, um, Survivors may not want to just be like, yeah, I, this happened to me, and I want to talk about it. You know, It may not look like that. Um, I think part of building trust is that patience and that commitment, but also just sort of building rapport and, and seeing, finding the humanity in that person through similar interests if you, if you can. So thank you. Thank you, Jessica, for sharing. And I, I really appreciate that you shared um, your common concerns and fears uh, about doing this work, but your, your normal advocacy skills paid you well when you listen to them and that being a woman in this field is not uncommon and going into a male prison is something that we can do as advocates and provide support for male survivors of sexual violence. So it was really great to hear you talk about your fears but also the skills you use to get through that and provide the services um, to your survivors and continue to do. So thank you. And before we move on um, to the service section, we have a poll we'd like to ask everybody. And the poll question is coming up on your screen right now. And with this poll question, what it is, it says, uh, what services, if any, in your organization already offering to incarcerate survivors, check all that apply. So the poll is open. And you can check any ones that apply. And so far, we're looking at a good majority of people are offering hotline services, groups, and systems advocacy. And I want to say thank you for taking the poll, and we're going to continue on to the next slides and just keep in mind where we're at. So there are all types of services that can be offered and since often people are talking about, we can move, um, this is the list that we think about, hotlines, medical advocacy, legal advocacy, systems advocacy, written correspondence, individual meetings, and group meetings. And this is kind of the, what we talk about when we talk about services being provided. We're going to talk about how they adapt to services in incarceration. So the first one is hotlines. And 65% of you mentioned that you are providing services via hotlines to inmates. So these are questions on this slide that you need to have answered as an organization. So how long will the calls be? How confidential is the line for the phone call? Um, how um, do you plan for off-topic calls? Do you know 
how to support someone when they make a report on the plot line. Um, those are some questions your organization really needs to kind of think about and how is confidentiality going to be kept in the phones and um, where the phone's located is like a counselor's office. So really thinking through the physical mechanism of a in per, uh, person using the hotline services while they are calling from an incarcerated position. So as we move forward, the written correspondence, there's a handout that JDI has created, so I'm going to briefly touch on it, but it's one of the highest used um, services for a lot of agencies because written correspondence is one that is easy for an inmate to access. Um, but, however, there is concerns here again to think about are there limits to confidentiality, um, what can you provide somebody, and who's going to be the one responding to all these written correspondence because not all staff members are really good at writing to written correspondence. I would want to be the one staff members that isn't. I provide better in person than writing. So really thinking about that and there's an excellent handout that has been provided in the handouts from JDI. So as we move on to the next service is individual meetings and that's a bulk of what Jessica was talking about was um, what is the direction the individual wants to take? What is the goal for the meeting? What considerations do you need to plan for the meeting? Um, like, what do you have to, who do you have to make phone calls with communication to get the meeting? Um, what are the, um, where are you meeting at? What considerations do you have to think about for confidentiality? I noticed that just under half of the group here said they're doing individual or group meetings. So really thinking this through that we as advocates can go into incarcerated settings and. PREA is making it very uh, new avenues and roads for this conversation because we can talk to our local systems and say uh, we can provide this service. But really asking the facility and the survivor where the space is going to be located at. So next we're going to talk about group work. And group work is something I have a very strong belief about because I provide services in incarcerated settings and for male survivors. Um, I, there was a little asterisk if you remember on the previous slide. Um, I believe they should be used as educational groups to communicate how a survivor can access your services or talk about sexual violence in general or talk about some coping skills. However, a peer-to-peer -peer group in um, prison settings can become very dangerous because confidentiality, inmates um, using the information against each other or staff using the information against the inmates because I've never run a group where the staff have not either been right out to the door or right in the room with us. So really thinking through that staff are going to be hearing everything so peer-to-peer -peer groups that we normally use don't normally work um, because we can't create that sense of safety and not just the sense but the actual safety that's needed for survivors. So as we move on to like medical advocacy, um, here are some questions for your organization. What's your agency's policy around medical accompaniments to the ER? Meaning, do you have one staff member go out? Do you have two staff members go out? Um, do they have any training on medical accompaniments for males? Um, often agencies kind of overlook this or brush this over, but there are um, trainings that can be provided by other TA providers that can give you support around working with males in um, medical company myths. Thinking about medical advocacy, often corrections officers will ask you to leave the room or will handcuff individuals and we need to have policies at our agency that we can talk about this before we ever have that scenario come face to face as an advocate. Um, the next um, service that we provide and often talk about is legal advocacy and does your agency provide legal advocacy through collaboration and referral and what is the role of your legal advocacy and what are some of the common needs? And these are questions for your agency and I'll go back over them. Um, what is the legal advocacy you provide through collaboration or referrals? Meaning if you have a survivor who is incarcerated, does your normal legal advocate have the ability or understanding to work with the individual or do you need to collaborate and find referrals for that individual? Um, what is the role of your advocacy and what are the common needs? So if an inmate says, I have been a survivor, I was attacked here in prison and now there's retribution happening against me and I'm having my food rations changed or I'm having my 
time out of my cell changed, and I'm having my phone calls limited, and there's these other concerns on top of uh, the sexual violence, and then there's the retaliation, and now there might be other legal concerns as well. What are the needs? Where would you go with those? So really talking to figure out within your agency what supports you can provide. And those also include reentry. So often we overlook reentry into our community and what are those legal needs for inmates and survivors. And having the extra stressor of being victimized, whether it be in prison or um, previously in the prison brings up everything, reentry can become even more difficult for an inmate. So really thinking through the legal needs, like what are the housing code area, uh, housing codes in your area for apartment and funding. Do they negate funding and resources to someone who's been incarcerated? So it gets rather large there. Um, and JDI has some really good support for you. Systems advocacy, advocacy is something that we just kind of started moving into a little bit, but who are the individuals at your agency that provide this support and what are their um, individual roles? This is really key in thinking about your board members do they collaborate or have collaborations with these institutions, jails, um, prisons? Often board members do have collaborations, and do we access those? Is your executive director um, there to establish formal policy change work, or who does that within your agency, with the outside agencies? Um, always it's best to have at least two advocates that can provide support to each institution, if not more because one advocate might become sick or might find a new job or win a million dollars. So you don't want to have the one advocate that worked with all of your local um, jails and prisons and RTFs to be missing um, after they move on. Um, and volunteers. Do you have any volunteers that have dual roles within your agency? Um, and how can they provide support? And a dual role may be that they also work at the county prison or they also have family members that work there. Do they have any ability to work with this population. Often we don't talk about in our volunteer training on how to help out with systems advocacy. So the next slide um, that we're going to go through is just talking about what are the concerns do you have about working with this population. If you could write that in the question box. As well, um, I want to just put out there for the people who wrote down 16% for other services. I'm very curious to know what your other services are, and I think the other panelists might be. So we'll open that um, question box up and let people respond. So anybody have concerns or fears they would like to put out there about working with the population? And if not, understand. How do we change culture among correctional staff? It's long term. It's like any system that we've had um, limited inroads with. Um, correctional staff aren't like medical staff, and they won't be as freely open to change. Um, because there's no large systems. However, with PREA, there are distinct rules and guidelines. And one thing I know about correctional staff is, one, they like following the rules and guidelines they are given. And two, they want to have safe um, populations. And they don't want to have any sort of um, violence. So if you come out to how you can help them out with their job, that helps them out. Um, I see a lot more. Um, let me pull up some more. Another question is um, just limited experience in working with prisons or a statement. That is a fear because if you don't have much experience in working with incarceration, um, it does become quite fearful. Um, letting go of stereotypes is a really powerful statement um, because we often have those stereotypes. I know one year I was watching the Super Bowl because it was something I was requested to do, and while I was watching the Super Bowl, the commercial, I counted over 47 different commercials making fun of rape prison jokes. And it's in our culture, and those stereotypes are there. So letting go of those, especially when they're reinforced. Um, Bo said earlier that a crime does not mean that um, sexual violence is um, an acceptable 
added on punishment. Um, I also see that um, I work as a prevention educator and want to know how to engage conversations about sexual abuse when it comes to boys and men with young men who are currently in juvenile hall. Um, that's a great question, uh, and there's a lot of ways you can do that, but the easiest ways are to start the conversation on where they're at with what their experiences are. What are they already seeing in juvenile hall? Asking open-ended questions, having listening sessions with individuals. That will help shift and change where you go in your conversations to make them really appropriate um, for what their needs are. So you're not talking about them or to them or at them. Instead, you're having conversations and dialogue with them. And that alone will shape their future for higher resiliency and it will help them figure out who they can and cannot talk to. Um, bouncing trust with not disclosing our information. Um, trust building with not disclosing the information. I'm taking that question as. Um, when that's why it's really important for our agencies to understand what our confidentiality is and making that very clear, whether it be our executive director with um, local jail and prison um, officials, what those boundaries of confidentiality are. Um, often I hear there's a lot of individuals who are discussing the concept of um, going into prisons and not feeling like they'll listen to you. Um, that's very common. And what I can say is it takes some time to build up those relationships So really finding every way you can have conversations. Sometimes your religious groups have more influence or ends. So if you have any ties with religious groups or churches, that's how I found my way in the one local jail that I worked with. Um, often you are talking about victims dismissed, their needs are dismissed, there's conflict within small communities with their interest of, well, keeping people safe. Um, these concepts about keeping individuals safe in the community are larger stereotypes, and that means we need a better job of actually responding to what it means to be incarcerated in our, our country. And I see there are some other questions that might be answered by other panelists. I'll give them a second. So yeah, I wasn't sure, I'm sorry, I wasn't sure I, w I was having a little bit of difficulty, but um, were we able to address the question of how do we know if an inmate reporting prison rape is truthful and not for personal gain? I haven't gotten that part oh, down. Sorry, so, sorry. Um, yeah, so I just, I guess I, what I wanted to kind of chime in on and just, um, and talk about that issue is, you know, one of the things just recently having gone to um, some prisons in New York and doing focus groups um, with both staff and inmates, um, staff oftentimes bring that up, that, you know, somebody is just, is just saying that they're being abused so that they can be moved to another cell or that they can, um, you know, that they can, you know, um, or something else can happen or they want to be moved somewhere else or they um, and so one of the things that I think it's important to think about as advocates is that you know we we have to trust and believe that the person isn't doing it for personal gain I mean there's no way of really knowing that um, however some of the consequences of reporting abuse can be really um, sometimes can be a lot of backlash and so that happened to inmates when they do report abuse like some people are taken away from their programs or not able to do um, the work um, they might be have a work assignment that they're no longer able to do and so I really think the risk of reporting is much higher uh, and having some kind of retaliation or something taken away from you um, is, is, is more detrimental and versus people doing it for a personal gain. Definitely, Jessica, and thank you for that response. Um, the, the quickest way of framing it in your mind is all the barriers of masculinity, all the barriers of fear and safety, to come forward and share a story of sexual violence doesn't add, add up. So we believe survivors. It doesn't end when we enter into an incarcerated um, facility. And we need to advocate that way. Thank you. There are several more questions. Um, yeah, there's some questions just around, just some general fears um, around, 
you know, being in a facility where something can happen, whether it can be a lockdown or if a, if, if, if a prisoner tries to escape or hurt someone else. And, um, and I think those are, those are definitely valid concerns. I mean, you never know what could possibly happen when you go into a prison. Um, however, um, I think that, um, you know, when thinking about your own, you have to think about your own safety when you walk in. There's certain things that you have to be aware of, your surroundings and what's going on, um, especially when you're, you're kind of going through the entire system. Um, however, if you're going in to meet with a prisoner to do a one-on-one -on -one meeting, a lot of times those are really insecure places, um, and so you can meet um, in, in a different variety. So looking at what options or what opportunities are available for you to meet someone with a survivor that is creating safety for you, but also for, um, for, for that inmate as well. And so you have to really kind of think about that ahead of time. Um, hey, this is Carolina. Um, do we want to move on to the Q&A portion? I know this is kind of merged into the Q&A, which is great. A lot of fantastic stuff. Um, is that all right, Eric and Tara? Yeah, yeah I think good. that's perfect. Okay. And off from what you just said about, um, you can always, I always find that when I work in prison settings or RTF, if you go in respectfully and say, can I have a walkthrough, can you explain to me what happens for this procedure before ever meeting anybody, before any phone call, just say I'm a local agency, I'd like to have a walkthrough, I have staff here that like to do a walkthrough, where the advocates, where the counselors, we want to know people, they will more than welcome do that, more than willingly do that, and they tell you what happens. And that can alleviate fears, and you can ask questions, and it also gives you an idea of the lived experiences of the people you're going to be working with. But do it before you get the phone call. I think that's a great point. Um, so there's been a lot of questions. Some of them have been answered. Some of them haven't. Um, I think uh, the first question, let's, uh, Jessica, if you don't mind answering this one. Um, the question is, how do, we, how do we help people understand that even people who have been convicted of sex offenses do not deserve to be sexually assaulted? Yeah, um, that's a great question and, and something that I think comes up a lot, and it makes sense that we as, like, you know, survivor advocates might have some feelings around that. Um, my sort of philosophy around it is that, you know, as human beings, we all have the right to decide what happens to our bodies and who gets to touch them, and and that's just a, something we all have the right to. And, and, and even if you violated that right for someone else, it doesn't take that right away from you. Um, and it's kind of like, you know, JDI's tagline of, like, you know, rape's not part of the penalty and that's something that I just really firmly believe in. I think everyone has the right over their own bodies, no matter what. Great. And Eric or Tara, anyone else want to add anything to that? Okay. Next question. Thanks, Jessica. Um, for Eric, um, this question, if the facility that the individual is incarcerated in does not have str a strong PREA presence, what would you suggest for advocates to do to help promote that? Uh, one of the best ways to help promote that is to go to your state coalition for starters um, and ask your coalition for support around this because most states have a PREA coordinator or someone allotted that time for the PREA coordinator. And if your state does not, say you're in Indiana, for example, you can contact us, the National Center. Um, and we can help support you and find the avenues and explain the PREA. Often what I find is local jails will not have a strong PREA presence because they feel overwhelmed, staff turnover. There's a plethora of reasons why or they just feel it doesn't apply to them. Um, and they feel like they can get by. Um, so it's a matter of educating them on PREA, but not lecturing PREA. And that helps them work through it. But you need some partnerships. And usually state coalition, your state coalition is the best partnership to have. If all of those answers don't work and you call me and we can't figure it out, I will find somebody to help you. <laughs> Yes, and you can also call um, just attention as well. Um, and we work with a lot of different um, correctional facilities across the country, and so there might be a way for us to assist as well. And another thing, just a little FYI, I always found a nice trick for working with local jails, is if you find the biggest prison around that is in local area and you say this prison is doing it, 
especially if they are, you know, make sure they are doing it, the local jails will fall in line because they kind of like want to fall in line with the local mm -hmm. larger systems. Great. Um, our next question for Jessica. Um, someone asked, what suggestions do you have for female advocates when asked personal questions or inappropriate questions from a survivor? This is a great question um, and something that I worried about too. Um, I think that's where boundaries really come in. Um, and I think a lot of survivors want to know if we are survivors too. And I think that that tends to come from a place of just feeling really isolated and um, and another thing too is that you know a lot of survivors, especially survivors who are incarcerated, you know, they, they don't have their own boundaries. They don't get to have their own boundaries, and so they, you know, are going to model that in their interactions with you potentially. And so we sort of are in a position where we have to model those healthy boundaries and just say, you know, my sort of stock answer is that you know we're not here to talk about what I've been through. We're here to talk about what you've been through. And if they continue to push, then I might say something like, you know, um, what I've been through is not important right now. Or I might say, I'm wondering if you're feeling really isolated, and that's why it's important that you're asking me that. And um, and try to put it back on them and, and make it less about me as much as possible. And, um, and if I'm starting to feel really uncomfortable, to just say so and just say, you know, I'm not comfortable with this. You know, this is not, I'm not here to talk about that. And you know, I won't, I won't answer that question. And it might be really uncomfortable to do that, but you're also sort of modeling like that it's okay to say no. It's okay to not go there if you don't want to. And I would even add to that, I'm sorry. That's okay. I, I would even add to that, that it's even, and it's okay to even have a, a further dialogue about boundaries and what are boundaries, um, and just working with some inmates. Um, some folks have you know, been incarcerated for many, many years, have came in when they were very young and may have not have had any real conversation about what is a boundary and how do you set boundaries. So it can actually lead into another discussion as well. And coming from a male advocate, because many, we're hopefully getting more male advocates in the field, I know it comes up for male advocates and it came up for me often, uh, where those questions would come out of like, about my own history of sexual violence victimization or my own body and usually asking I'm a little bit confused what are you what why are you why are you asking this so if there's some concern what, what about this is making you think about this because um, quite frankly I come in here an hour a week and I leave so I'm wondering what what you're thinking about me in that aspect for and it opens a dialogue just so much and every time it comes down to what is healthy Usually it's what is healthy sexuality, what is an STD, what is victimization look like, um, can someone believe me who's a victim or not a victim, like, so really ask what is about you when you leave and you're only there one hour a week, really reframes it often and they, they open up. Great, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, Eric and Jessica, I think, if, Eric, if you want to try first, uh, or not try, but answer first. Um, what do you do about a conflict of interest involving two different individuals reporting assault against each other? Have you ever had that happen to you? Or if, if that had, what would you do? Um, I've had that happen. Um, and I had it happen in the RTF, residential treatment facility, a juvenile uh, facility. And what happened there was, they both came forward and expressed that the other individual had assaulted each, you know, each other. Um, so we split advocates up, and our agency each took one individual. And we discussed with them about themselves. And as time progressed, actually, one turned out to be the aggressor, and the other one was the one who being, was being assaulted against. And the aggressor was using it as a way of getting out of um, punishment at the facility um, by saying they were assaulted. So we worked with them. We found that person was not the aggressor, um, I mean, was, was the aggressor in that situation, and they were also previously assaulted. 
So now we have that extra layer of they were assaulted before coming in, now they were assaulting another individual, and what were we going to do with that? So we worked on them with the previous assault, and someone else worked with them what they just had done. We never, get, we never stopped because we looked at them as, and it's really hard for me, I'm stumbling over my words because I want to, um, their names are coming to mind because that's what we called them. They were just young men and we worked with them. We didn't stop working with them. But we had a, a ED that we looked into that and we had policy and procedures on what we would do. So that was very helpful. Great. And Jessica, did you have anything to add? Um, that situation has never happened to me. I think if it did, the first thing I would do would be to call my supervisor and ask them what to do, to be honest. Um, we, we have worked with youth that have um, used violating behaviors, if you will. I have a hard time saying youth perpetrators. Um, and I think kind of what Eric was saying that, you know, especially for, for young, for children, you know, those behaviors come from somewhere. They're learned from somewhere. And so, that this particular youth was a survivor. And so we sort of were able to shift our mindset and be like, all right, we're here advocating for this person as a survivor and understanding that their behavior is a direct result of the trauma that they experience, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think that, you know, that goes back to a lot of what Eric said earlier is just, you know, making sure your agency has a plan and knowing, like, when is it, when do you need more support from your agency, right, um, on top of how, how you would have handled it. So um, I think that's all the time we have for these questions. Um, but if we didn't get to your question and there were a lot we didn't get to, um, feel free to email us at advocate at justattention.org and we will definitely get back to you on that. Um, and I'm going to turn things back over to Bo. We encourage you to download um, JDI's publication called Hope Behind Bars, an advocate's guide to helping survivors of sexual abuse and detention. This guide is free and can be found as a handout attachment here on the advocates resource section of JDI's website. Um, it includes a lot of helpful tips and other information on providing services to incarcerated survivors. There are other resources uh, we think you might find helpful regarding working with male survivors behind bars. We have lots of resources on JDI's Advocate Resources webpage. We also encourage you to visit the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, <coughs> the Prayer Resource Center, and One in Six which is an organization that provides help for male survivors. JDI has a resource guide for survivors of sexual abuse behind bars, which is a guide that lists legal and psychological counseling resources by state for survivors who are still incarcerated, those who have been released, and loved ones on the outside who are searching for ways to help. If your agency is interested in being listed for as a resource on JDI's uh, resource guide, please fill out the form found on the link on your screen. We will also include the link in our follow-up email later today. Our next webinar will be the World of Corrections, Perspectives on Prisoner Culture and Men's Prisons, which will be on Thursday, September 30th. In that webinar, we'll talk about prisoner culture and male facilities in order to increase advocates' understanding of sexual abuse and harassment in these detention settings. You can register at the link on the slide. We'll also send this out in today's follow-up email. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please take a moment to complete the evaluation and provide us with your feedback. The link to the evaluation is on the slide here, and you will also receive it an email shortly. On the screen, you will find more information if you need to get in touch with us. You can always email Just Detention at advocates at justdetention.org. If you'd like to get in touch with Eric, his email address is ericstyles at nsvrc.org. Thank you again for joining us. And again, that Eric's email address is e styles at nsbrc.org. Thanks.